over time doing a, um, a SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Um, we've done strengths, we've done weaknesses, we've done opportunities. Today we want to talk about uh, some threats as we begin, and then let's pray after that, and then we'll take uh, time to, uh, uh, to talk about the particular subject matter um, from the book uh, today. So a strength and a weakness are internal. An opportunity and a threat are external to the church. We talked about uh, some opportunities externally uh, last week. What are some of the threats that you believe Northside is facing? The things that we don't have control over from the outside of us, in our city, in our culture, in our neighborhoods, in our community, uh, that that could create problems or difficulties um, keeping Northside from being the church that maybe God has called us to be. What are what are some of the threats we may be facing, Gary? Brother, remember when, when we were kids, when you talked about with your classmates, the question was not. Do you go to church? It's where do you go to church? Right. Because the assumption was everybody is here. Yeah. That's not the case at all. They may have gone to the wrong church. Right. But they did go to church somewhere, mostly. And today, that's no longer. And so, in what way is that a, a threat to us? I agree with you. In what way? So, so, take that the next step. How does that challenge us as a church? So as, as, a, as we reach out to others, it's not a matter of can we redirect your, your thoughts, that would create a whole new set of thoughts. Okay, yeah, 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 excellent, yeah. Technology, that people, we, we don't speak much. It's taxing and even though we have the online service, you know, the body doesn't function separate from each other, right? It has to be together to... to Technology is not an opportunity? But it comes to be a threat. Okay, that's one of those things that can cut both ways. So keep going. Uh, our occupation with technology. Yeah, we're, we're just, we're very entertained with it that, that takes precedent. Right? Okay. Can, uh, you know, we, we, you know, the promise of uh, the new technology is that we bring people together, and in some ways it might, but it also pulls people apart. Isolation. Yeah. Okay. Charlie. I hate to mention this, but when I was growing up. Oh. Okay. <laughs> you grew up in the last century. Yes. Well, I was going to die. Almost everything was closed on Sunday morning. Yeah. Which made, I mean, everybody knew they were going to go to church. Right, right. So church somewhere, but now. And now everything is, you know, it's like you don't need to go to church. Yeah. Well, good. Soccer matches and, yeah. and yeah. Person, David. And I, maybe you could better define the things that are beyond our control. But it seems like to me one of the greatest threats we face, but this is in our control, is the temptation to think as many evangelical Christians do, seem to, that the way to make godly change is through politics rather than uh, sharing the gospel with others. Right, and so, um, I mean, let me, let's, let's, let's talk about that, let's play off of that. So I think there are a couple of things. One is the, the assumption that some have that if we could just change the, the laws or the, the, the order of things externally, that that would then make everyone right. more Christian or if, more... If we could make the laws, then the world would be better. Yeah, and um, 
that's not working or they keep, keep, keep going. And so, but, but to me, it's ungodly. Yeah. It's not the way God has called us to operate in the world. Yeah. Jesus had that opportunity and he didn't take it. Right. That, that was one of the temptations that, that Jesus faced in the wilderness was precisely that. And, and, and he turned it down. That's not, that's not because it happens from the inside out. Right. Not the outside uh, in. So I don't know if that's a threat or not. I, I wonder if I'm... Yeah, I, I think so. And, and if I can add to that, I, I think sometimes we allow um, the political debates that are going on around us that, that may be inevitable in, in, in some way to creep into the conversations we have in church so that the polarization we see out there becomes a polarization that takes place here. So that's, that's, that's a side effect, or that's a different, a different issue. But if we allow the political debate that's waging out there in which compromise is not possible, and in which you have to, if you don't agree with me, then I have to oppose you, when that, when that becomes a conversation or the, uh, the instinct of Christians inside, then, then, um, then we become polarized and divided in the way the world is. Uh, and, and I think we, we must have let that happen. I saw another hand. Yes, sir. I was going to talk about, and you brought, you brought it up now, the polarization okay. and the single issue stuff. All right. I believe that this is correct and this is a single issue. Right. Okay. At the risk of causing trouble, I might say abortion. We were talking abortion, capital punishment. Right. There's, so there's one issue. One issue, and, and, and I don't care what you think about anything else. That one issue makes you bad. Yeah. Yeah. And unfortunately, I only see one issue which might make somebody else bad. Yeah. Offense. Right. But looking at the uh, mirror more, more politically, you know, I like Obama. Therefore, you can't. I can't go to your church because your church says Trump's okay, but the church shouldn't be saying Trump's okay. Church should be saying just go both. Yeah. So finding a way, I didn't know, yeah, yeah, so that we can embrace people who, who are different than we are, even who have different opinions than we is runs against the culture. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, part of the political problem I see is today we're getting businesses that are so involved in that political dialogue that, you know, I may not agree with what a business totally does, but if I want to shop there, I have that choice, or I have that choice not to. But when they start interjecting their politics into the culture, it affects everyone. And we've seen that this past week with Disney. And I think if we would just, if businesses would just be businesses, and stay out of those venues, it would be better for everyone. Okay. All right. Other yes. Go ahead, sir. I've come to believe that being political interferes with my spiritual life altogether, and I would like to be apolitical. Yeah. Yeah, some people may make a different choice, but certainly the first part of that is the, the politics can and often does interfere with our spiritual life, our spiritual journey. Yeah, yeah, uh, and it's it's certainly um, affecting affecting the church. Yeah, Tom. Yeah, there's a, I think it's Psalm thirty six two. Is that we're too wise for our own eyes to detect or hate our own sin? And for me, I think the greatest threat is my pride. Our pride, biblical literacy, as I take a look at the New Testament, I see that the Israel of nation no longer loved God and loved God's word. It became all about the 1,500 rules for the Sabbath, the Mishnah, what the leader said was correct. And no, it was, there was no longer a conviction just to love God's word. Okay. So I would say biblical literacy and, and, and pride and not willing to surrender and submit to the authority all right. Uh, certainly, that's a, a dominant um, cultural uh, trend. Yes, Linda. A tangent off of Todd's uh, 
verbiage and this thought about pride is the threat because of pride and not uh, being willing to serve one another. Okay. And um, we grew up seeing it done and knowing that that was something that we wanted to do to give because we love the Lord and to give back. But it was also, we were brought along, an older person would bring a younger person into class and, and have them teach with them to learn how to teach the children. Well, we, if, as you know, for months, Miss Nicole has asked for teachers and helpers and teachers and helpers in each, each um, time it's been a problem and it's, it's um, in many of our younger people they aren't of the mindset they don't have the, the sight or they didn't catch that um, to, to serve you know, others so lots of to yeah. serve others and, and be a teacher to be a greeter whatever that is not a gospel thing, but it's a serving one another. Right. And it's characteristic that, that kind of emerges from, from, from our culture. That's it. One last comment and then we need to we need to move on. Yes, sir. When I was a child uh, going to school in Germany, yeah, yeah. we had Bible study twice a week. Mm -hmm. For the Catholic kids, the police, the Protestant kids, Protestant ministers. But then later on they gave the lesson over to the teachers. Mm. And they were all, they had to be all party members. And then the religion changed. Mm. It was all anti-Jewish. Mm. They convinced yeah. us that the Jews killed the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there are all kinds of, of, of pressures externally um, <clears throat> and recognizing the difference between the kind of cultural norms and the gospel are, are going to be really crucial issues. Let's let's pause um, and pray. I'm, I'm aware of, of needs within within uh, this group, so let me just kind of gather these thoughts together, and, and then we'll take the last 40 minutes or so of our time together to, to discuss the material uh, of, uh, of this week's uh, lesson. Father, we are grateful uh, to you for loving us, for um, forgiving us, for um, accepting us even when we're blind, um, for giving us strength even when we're weak. Help us, Father, that we may be aware enough of the, the cultural pressures around us. Not that we'll resist culture because we live in it, but that we will know what is gospel and what is not. Bless our church family uh, for all those who are hurting, ill. For those who are excited about new opportunities and blessings, help us to find a spirit of joy uh, uh, with them. Uh, protect us and guide us in our, our conversations today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I, I, I've indicated as we've begun that if it's not a requirement to be in this discussion today uh, that you have uh, read this book, nor am I hawking the book. Um, but it, it served as a, as a guide for us for the conversations we, we need to have. And so we're, we're in chapter four today. Chapter one, um, uh, what's the problem? The problem is churches are dying. And they're going to have to die one way or the other, either by dwindling, diminishing, or through an act of congregational surrender and discipleship. Mm -hmm. Secondly, choices have consequences. <coughs> there were choices made uh, 100 years ago, 120, 140 years ago, by our spiritual ancestors and the heritage that we are part of and that, and that we love that 
had a dramatic impact on what happened to Church of Christ in the 20th century. The choices we make as a church family have consequences, not just for how this church looks and how it operates in the, in the coming year, but upon our children and our children's children and upon uh, the, the, the culture around us. Chapter 3 uh, goes back to that, that extraordinary story that I'm calling the Blue Hole, the source stream uh, uh, on Church of the Christ, and that was a, an extraordinary drive to unity. <laughs> we were a unity movement. We were committed to peacemaking. Uh, <laughs> the commitment to restoration was a means to be united. It was quite a while before our churches refer to themselves as a restoration movement. That happened later. At the beginning, we were a unity movement. And the impulse toward unity is still in our bloodstream. It's still in our DNA. Even though we've gone a long time without unity being an emphasis for us, without, without talking about it in much. It's still our story. And so part of what I'm wanting to do is is to remind us of, of our story that, that, that there is a commitment not for everyone to agree, but to love one another even when we disagree. And so at the beginning, when you came to not just congregations, but movements who had different and, and a large number of issues, uh, came together to love one another anyway. That was the original instinct. Chapter 4 is about restoration. Uh, and so let me, let me make a comment or two. I want to I pull uh, 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 put a hook into some things we talked about last week. Uh, and then let's, let's see where we are and where, where we're going. We talked a little bit last week about um, the tendency for, for us to, to look back on a golden age. Um, nostalgia is the word that was given to, to it a few hundred years ago, which doctors treated as a disease. Um, the reason it's called the golden age, uh, this, this goes back to um, uh, the, 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 the Roman and, and Greek worlds, uh, you know, 400 B.C., 300 B.C., um, uh, all the way through, you know, the age of, of, of Jesus and the Roman Empire, they're, they're, the, the stories were told of the world having uh, uh, evolved over four different ages. The current age was the Iron Age, in, in which everyone's in rebellion, and, 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 and there is no purpose in and and, uh, and 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 each human uh, is doing whatever they want to do. That's the current age. But the age before that, the way things used to be was the Bronze Age, in which humans rebelled against the gods and were arrogant and haughty, which is how we get the word brazen. Someone is just brazen. They're just haughty. Well, that comes from that story that that there was a time, so it went from bronze to iron, but before bronze was, was silver, in which everything fell apart. This is when the rebellion of humans against the gods first took place. But in the beginning was the golden age, in which everything was good and right, in which trees dripped with, with honey. And so there's been a part of Western civilization, this sense, that in the old days, things were great, but things have gotten worse. They're not good now, but boy, they used to be. They used to be good. One of the things we talked about last week, which I was reminded of again uh, in the last few days, uh, for most of us, whether we think about our childhood or whether we think about an earlier time in church, things used to be better back then. As, as uh, you know, a, a lot of people think of the 50s as a golden age. The people in the 50s thought about the 30s as the golden age. 
people in the 30s, you know, talk about the turn of the century to go. I mean, each, each person tends to kind of look back. But what is a golden age or the good old days when things were great for some are not always great for others. Um, Part of the, one of the stories of, uh, of chapter uh, four is about Annie C. Tuggle. Uh, godly black woman, teacher, uh, leader, servant, one of, one of the, the great figures of the 20th century. In Churches of Christ, uh, when Annie was a young woman, a, a young teacher, there was a, a school in in Memphis that was set up for um, for black kids, for black teachers. Uh, black principal and a white superintendent who said that all of the children and all of the teachers had to enter school through the back door <coughs> in their own school. Only white people could enter through the front door. Brother Bowser, the principal, Refused the humiliation, and school was gone. School was done away with. What was the good old days for some? Not the good old days for everyone. Yeah. Uh, I love any trouble because so many of our first students became such extraordinary. Uh, godly uh, leaders, including um, Fred Gray, who was um, the lawyer for Rosa Parks and for Martin Luther King Jr., who argued before the Supreme Court. Fred is still uh, now in the late 80s or early early 90s. Is is a great preacher and a good friend to, to many, but he became who he became because of Annie, in spite of the difficulties and challenges they, they face. <coughs> One of the reasons I, I, I tell that is because there, there is a tendency for us to, to think, well, boy, that was awful back in those days, and, and any of you who've read chapter four know there's some stories that are harder to talk about even it happened among our our people in in what became a segregated uh, fellowship of churches for uh, a long, long time. But there there are many who would say that you know, well, boy, that was sad then, but at least it's no longer that way. We don't have that kind of stuff going on anymore. It used to be that way, but 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 all those problems have been have been have been solved. One of our members this last week, African American, went to uh, Farmer's Market, Pearl. She was looking at uh, maybe buying some grapes, a basket of grapes, and she was looking at the grapes, kind of comparing uh, the baskets of grapes. And the woman who was selling grapes said, why don't you go to your side of town to buy your grapes? And she said, why? She said, why don't you go to your side of town? To say that there is not racism in this country or in this city that, that church doesn't have to talk about 
the sin of racism anymore is, is an affront to too many people who experience racism in our city and in our church. Uh, sin is sin, and it, and it has to be talked about and addressed, and that we have to be in fellowship uh, of, of believers that, that sees what's going on around us, including among our own But this, this drive for a, a golden age is, is a part of, of the impulse that, that, that led uh, our spiritual ancestors and many others, by the way. This was not uh, unique to Church of Christ, Christian Church of Disciples of Christ, uh, that original movement, that Stone Campbell movement, that drove them to, to, to look, to want to restore that which had been perfect in the past. Uh, a couple of problems, I think, with, with that. And then, and then uh, let's, let's talk some about it. One, that instinct misses the fact that, that while Scripture is inspired, those early Christians were as messed up as we are. And to say we want we want to restore the new well the New Testament church which which one which of the New Testament churches would we want to be like the Galatian churches which Paul just roundly condemns Ephesus where they were fighting each other on issues of race by the way. Jew and Gentile, Church of Corinth, they couldn't even have the Lord's Supper together. So to talk about wanting to be what God calls us to be from Scripture is one thing. To say, we want to be like those in the, in the path. There, there are just a number of problems in making restoration the, the goal or the end or the assumption that many had. We have, we have. We have fully restored the New Testament church. Everything that God said in the New Testament, we have restored. Not some other group. One of, one of the things that we saw out of the frontier in the, the, uh, the 1830s and 40s, uh, you know, the competition out of the frontier, the frontier in those days was, was Kentucky and Tennessee and, and Ohio and Missouri. The competition were with the Baptists and the Methodists out on the frontier. These were the three groups that were kind of you know, kind of gaining a foothold in the cities. The Methodists, the Baptists, and Christians, disciples, churches of Christ. But there was a group of Baptists who were saying about the Baptist church what Church of Christ was saying about the Church of Christ. We have restored, we Baptists have restored the New Testament church. And when you read about the church in Scripture, it's not talking about all these other churches. It's talking about the Baptist church. We look at that and say, that's crazy. But that was the air in which our ancestors breathed. We have done it. We have uh, uh, accomplished it. And part of the problem with, with, that, with that restoration commitment is the, that the focus was on the externals. We have, we have the right church organization, and, and, and you have the right uh, steps of salvation, which are done in the right order, in the right way, for the right reasons. That if you if you if you you know have a, a church that, that takes the Lord's Supper every week, that if you get all those externals right, then the church has been restored. The problem is not with with a, a concern about the externals. I, I also want to be a part of a church that 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 has the externals right. I, I, I'm certainly not arguing against. Baptism a week for the Lord's Supper. I always want to be a part of, of a church like that. 
But just because we have restored the form of a church doesn't mean that the gospel lives in us. Restoring the externals without the heart of, of things uh, is, not, is not restoration. Nor can we ever assume that we have finally gotten to the point that we have everything right. We have it all right. Several, uh, a couple of years ago, Kim uh, Preston, teaching a class in, in this room, uh, he kind of done the, done the, done the math. He had taken about 20 of the issues that Church of Christ has divided over from multiple to one uh, cup uh, to uh, instrumental music, uh, acapella, and it just kind of lay that uh, whether a woman can pray in the presence of a man, just a number of things. The odds that you could get a group of people the size of Northside to agree on all 20 of those was into the millions. Then you add five more, or you add 10 more, and then just mathematically, the odds are in the billions. If the only way we can be together and work together is if we agree on every single issue, and if you don't agree, with me on this, is, you can agree with me on 19 out of 20. But if we disagree on number 20, one of us has to leave. And that has been the, the, the legacy of division of the 20th century in Church of Christ. I want to be the church that God calls us to be. I want to be the church of Scripture. I, that, that, that's Amen. not a question. But to assume that my understanding is perfect and that I can only worship the people who agree with me is a death knell of a, of a fellowship and of a congregation. And that's the downside of restoration. And when we, our heart says we want to restore the church but we don't restore one of the critical doctrines of the early church, which is unity. If we say we've, we're going to restore it, but unity doesn't matter, we have not restored or cared enough about what Jesus cared about. It's just finding a way to be a people of peace who embrace one another even when we disagree. Okay, I've talked too much. Uh, how would you how would you respond to that? Is that is that exhilarating? Is that discouraging? Is it shocking? Is it well? I've always believed that. Um, talk to me about the place of restoration and unity in uh, in our churches. I have a question. Yes, sir. We seem to have embraced Matthew seven one through five. Uh, from our considerations in the area of the okay. It's all about our judgment. And we're not supposed to be doing that when I read that passage. Judge not that you be not judged. Yes. Because those who judge will, get will judged. themselves be judged. judged. Yeah. It, how did that happen? I said somebody took an eraser to it. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, but it, it is, I mean, uh, to, to say, uh, I remember um, as a child being told, well, uh, we, we're not supposed to judge, but we can be fruit inspectors, and if other people's fruit, it doesn't, okay, it's another excuse for, for, for judging. It is to say, uh, if you don't get all the answers right, the way I've got all the answers right, you cannot be, and, it's because we think we're perfect. Yeah. And that's our problem. Yeah, it is. We've got to get over that. And it may be, uh, I may be saying this more strongly than, than, than you are, we have taken God's place in the scheme of things. 
and assume that it's our job rather than God's job to decide. Amen. I've been going along since the beginning of the year and I've been thinking about how the Christian, 
but we don't want to be the disciples. Yeah, yeah, and there really is a difference. I, I, we've we talked about this in, in relation to uh, our language. Uh, I understand our language, uh, and, and it's not that I'm overly critical of it, but when we talk about being a member, a member of Northside, member of this congregation, which is not a term we find in Scripture. I, I understand why, why, why we do it, but there's a difference between wearing the label Christian, being a member of a Christian community, being a member of a congregation, uh, being able to say, I, I, you know, yeah, I'm a Christian, I'm a, I'm a member of the Northside Church. Right? There's a difference between being a member and being a disciple. Uh, because a disciple means getting out of stuff. A disciple means looking out for your interests rather than mine. And my question is not, you know, what are my privileges? Because every show has privileges. What do I get to do? Or uh, I have a right, I have a right to whatever the next phrase is. Uh, that's not a Christian instinct. I'm going to claim my rights. The Christian instinct is who can I give up my rights for that would serve the other or allow them to, to, to act in a more Christian way? Those are altogether different things, being a member and being a disciple. Yeah. How much do you think our challenge is our comfort level? That it, it's not a matter of maybe what we truly believe, but it's just a matter of what makes us feel comfortable. Uh, right? Yeah. 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 And then, uh, so play, play that out. So, Jen, so uh, you're, you're saying sometimes we just want to be comfortable. <laughs> we just don't want to be made to feel uncomfortable. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's, yeah. Um, being, being, being comfortable, I, I don't like that. I don't like that. That, that. That's not the way we used to do it. That makes me yeah. uncomfortable. It's not a particularly gospel yeah. yeah. That's uh But it is deeply human, right? It's deeply human. Of course we're like that. At the center of any behavioral or organization change. Um, individually and as a group, people deciding to be uncomfortable for a while. Um, it, any any movement, whether it's individual change or organizational change, that's that that can be at the core. Yeah, uh, there's there's, a, there's an old book probably written 40 years ago by Bernard Eller called the Place of Sacraments. That makes I think an interesting argument that I think if I if I and make you write uh, an application that uh, relates to both of these, these comments. We have a tendency to think of, um, to talk about you know, church matters and then the real world, out of the real world. In the real world, this, or as we leave this place and go out into the real world, then we have to, as if what we're experiencing here is abnormal, or maybe say differently, extraordinary, extraordinary, beyond uh, uh, the ordinary. We're going to go out into kind of the, the, the real world, the ordinary world. What Ellis says is, uh, what we do and say in church, when, particularly when we participate in baptism and when we take up the communion, what we say is the world we live in is actually the abnormal world. The world God created and the world God intended is what we experience in baptism and supper and in community. This is the real world. This being a gathering of disciples, loving and serving and, and committed to one another and giving up 
our own interest for the interest of, of others. What we have breaking in is not something extraordinary. What we have breaking in is God's ordinary. The way God always wanted it to be and always wanted us to be. And so part of what we do in church is to remind each other of what God's ordinary is. And God's ordinary is about sacrifice. Can you think about God without thinking of what God or God's Son has sacrificed for our sake? Sacrifice for the sake of others in, in God's nature. That's God's ordinary. God, Jesus did not consider poverty with God something to be clung to that into himself. Take a form of a servant, being obedient even to death. Philippians 2. That's God's ordinary. That's the world God created. Which is what we remind each other and what we celebrate and what we encourage each other to when we come together every week that we will embrace God's ordinary. At the end. Sorry, I'm going to maybe throw a wrench in your... Oh, you would never do that. No, no, Matthew, that would never happen. Well, one, one, one thing that I thought was uh, interesting, um, yeah, there's an article that MIT Review got a uh, uh, got a, a internal document of data linked on uh, Christian interaction and communication on Facebook. And uh, in 2019, so this is very recent history, 19 out of the top 20 sort of Christian themed Facebook pages engaged with clicked on online were all run by foreign operated troll farms that created, you know, these Jesus memes that we all agree with. We can all, they're all, you know, what we can, you know, agree to. They celebrate Jesus. Um, yet they were operated by troll farms that when the narrative suits, uh, what some other interest of power wants to convey to an American Christian audience, they can just start injecting that into the conversation. So, you know, part of the, the issue is, is yeah, that the, our, you know, bringing it down to the ordinary, right? If, if, if God is, or if, if um, our expression as Christians is this call to the ordinary, and our understanding of the ordinary is formed by the communication that we have with each other, we've been presented, there are 19 out of the top 20 pages that are representative connection between Christian community are at their core a disinformation campaign. And I, I don't like that's, it's like a, I, a description of this is that the modern media environment that Christians find themselves in is loaded with like truth bombs that are breaking apart society before we even get to the church and come in to have a conversation about what of being a Christian, what does that expression even mean? Which is to say, yeah, I, I don't have any doubt that, that that's true. If we're going to be normed by God's normal, if church is about being normed into God's ways, we need to be careful to make sure they're actually God's ways rather than the ways that Christianity is often shaped and um, um, infused into the rhetoric of our church. And I would say the call to ordinary seems right to me, but it's, it's almost, you need an ordinary that's also connected to an actual reality. Like, yeah, yeah. That, that you actually need that communication with another human being. You need to prioritize what you interact with in your local community, with your neighbors, with your family at the dinner table, that those that those connections are way more valuable and we've taken them for granted yeah. than, than, than in, in this modern context that we find ourselves in. We've got about two minutes for a class, so I'm going to get one last comment and then uh, read one thing and then we're done. That sounds like a lot of indoctrination. And I wonder if we need to realize that we were being indoctrinated back 50 years ago. Yeah. And those of us who grew up within the, the mainstream Church of Christ likely attended Bible studies that had gospel advent quarterlies. And those, everybody was lined up and 
teaching the same lesson the same way, and you know, that's just a different medium mm -hmm. uh, than what the problem is. We don't get back to the source document enough. We don't go back to the Bible enough to verify and validate and to open our minds and think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which goes back to Todd's statement about biblical illiteracy. We don't actually know. Uh, there's a difference between what we were taught in Sunday school by a sermon and what, what comes from Scripture. They both may or may not be uh, the same. One, one last uh, uh, story, and then we will move on to one, one more week. Lisa and I had, uh, a number of years ago, a uh, beautiful face, a portrait face, a precious face given to us by a friend that uh, a, a, a workman in our home uh, accidentally broke. Uh, on the floor, it was broke, broken too. And it was just devastating to us. And so we found a pottery restorer in town. We did a remarkable job in restoring this thing so that you really can't even, even see. If, if we had taken that to the restorer and it came back in a box with 15 different pottery shards in it, we would have said, uh, whatever this guy is, he's not a very good restorer. We've not done a good job being restorers because the history of our fellowship is littered with division. Just division after division after division after division. And in part, I think, is because the restoration that we have too, too often sought is just an external one, having all the right markers, having the right organization, and, and missing this discipleship piece, of this part of it. So just this, this, the last couple of, of, of paragraphs, and, and, and then we'll be on. If there will be a commitment to restoration, let it be genuinely restorative. Let it be restorative of relationships. Let it be restorative of gentleness. Restorative of peacemaking. Let it be restorative of respect for human dignity and divine worth. Of patience and integrity. Let it be restorative of the gospel. If we will be committed to restoration, let us treat others as God has treated us, with sacrifice, with mercy, by emptying ourselves first, by seeking others' interests ahead of our own. Before anything else, let our commitment to restoration be restorative of grace. Let it restore justice. Let it restore joy, faith, long suffering. And hope. It is not that the restoration of externals has no merit, but church forms have no value if hearts have not first been transformed into the heart of Jesus. And that's the restoration that we must seek. May God be with us, with this church as we attempt to restore those things that are closest to God's heart. Amen. May He restore in our hearts the heart of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Blessings. Thank you all.